I have a story from my childhood that still gives me the chills to this day. It was Halloween night, and I was out with my friends trick-or-treating. We were hitting all the houses up that had their porch lights on, while avoiding the ones that did not have any lights at all. We had pillowcases with us so we could get the maximum amount of candy home without missing any. Call it the fear of missing out, but we were not going to miss anything tonight. We were all dressed up as different Ninja Turtles and had fake, real-looking weapons and everything. So we hit up about 50 houses and our pillowcases were getting full. We were all together laughing and joking. The streets were filled with people dressed up and doing the same thing we were doing. We had hit up almost all the houses in a particular neighborhood when we realized that we were at the edge of the neighborhood light. If we were to proceed any further forward, we would be in the darkness. But this is a safe area, and we weren't worried too much about something dangerous happening. But it was rather eerie how the light from the streetlight cut off so dramatically, and anywhere past it was complete darkness. That's when it happened. There was a voice in the darkness. It said, Hey, little boy, come here. We all froze in fear and looked at each other with the most terrifying expressions on our faces. It was clear that everyone had heard the same thing, and it was not a figment of our imagination. There was a voice in the darkness calling to us, and we couldn't see anything either. It was just dark. When we did not respond, the voice yelled, You better come here now, or I'm coming to get you. We all panicked. We dropped our candy and ran as fast as possible to the biggest adult we could find. We told him that there was someone in the darkness that was trying to get us to come to him. The big man confidently went to the location we showed him and shined his flashlight into the darkness. He told the voice to come out now. Suddenly breaking the silence, all you could hear was a fast run over leaves, but you couldn't see anything. Suddenly, a disfigured man tackled the big man at full speed, knocking him down. He started beating the big man right in front of us. At least the big guy was smart enough to tell his other big buddies where he was going. His friends rushed over to the situation that was going down and grabbed the crazy man and secured him to the ground. The police were called and took the deranged man into custody. It turns out that this man was a transient, shacking up near neighborhoods with the intent to rob the houses, selling the stolen items, and moving on to a new neighborhood. But what did he want with us? He could have just been silent and continued his ruse. Sometimes it keeps me up at night trying to figure out what would have happened if we had gone to the darkness towards his voice. It was October and the small town I lived in was in full swing decorating for Halloween. There were pumpkins on the porch, fake graves in the yard, and spider webs everywhere. It was very festive and really fun to see what new things people would come up with to up their Halloween competition game. It was a competition in a fun way as all the people knew each other and they were very kind. It was actually the perfect area to grow up in, that is, until something happened that has haunted my memories forever. We didn't know who at the time, but somebody started stealing the pumpkins. But it wasn't just that. The first pumpkin that went missing was Miss Curtis's. Her house was decorated well, and her pumpkins were top-notch. However, her pumpkins were missing. She asked around to see if anyone knew who would have taken the pumpkins, and why. She asked the sheriff as well, just to let him know what happened. The next day, the sheriff went to Miss Curtis's house to talk to her more about the pumpkin kidnapping, but she was not there. Her car was in the driveway, and her door was unlocked, but she was nowhere to be found. The sheriff searched the whole house and found no trace of her. As the sheriff was walking away from Miss Curtis's house, he got a call from dispatch that Mr. Carpenter needed to talk to the sheriff right away. The sheriff drove straight over and saw Mr. Carpenter. He asked what the trouble was, and Mr. Carpenter told him that his pumpkins were missing as well. With a rising sense of anxiety, he asked Mr. Carpenter if he had noticed anything suspicious. 
There was no additional information except for the fact that the pumpkins were missing. Hoping that Miss Curtis's sudden disappearance was an isolated incident, the sheriff told Mr. Carpenter to be safe and that he would be back in the morning to check on him. He went back to the station to file a missing persons report on Mrs. Curtis and looked for any available family to ask if they knew of her whereabouts. There was no one listed as next of kin in the system. The next day, the sheriff got up, ate breakfast, and drove straight to Mr. Carpenter's house. Once again, the car was in the driveway. The door was unlocked, but there was no Mr. Carpenter. Now, extremely frustrated, the sheriff was getting concerned. He went back to the station to file a missing persons report on Mr. Carpenter and find a contact for a family member, but once again, there was no next of kin listed. While he was at the station, dispatch came over and told him that a Mr. Loomis was on the phone, and once again, there were missing pumpkins. The sheriff drove over there, got the story, and told Mr. Loomis about the disappearances that both started with the front porch pumpkins missing the day before. Mr. Loomis brushed it off as a silly idea and said no one was going to disappear him. With the writing on the wall, the sheriff told Mr. Loomis that he would be back the next day to check on him, but he lied. The sheriff picked out a great spot and hid from any eyes that could find him around Mr. Loomis's residence. The sheriff waited for a while with nothing happening. It was about two in the morning when the sheriff saw a white creeper van pull up to Mr. Loomis's house. Two big men got out and entered the front door. However they entered, it was a clean way like picking a lock or something, which made it harder to realize that it was an abduction case. The two men exited the house with a body bag in tow. They threw it in the back of the van and drove off. The sheriff followed them to a trailer deep in the woods. He waited until they unloaded the bag and entered the trailer. He got his Sig Sauer and shotgun ready and proceeded to the trailer, ready for a fight. He kicked the door open and told the two men to get on the ground now. One did, but the other started backing up with his hands behind his back. The sheriff told him to show his hands, but there was no response. The sheriff saw what the man was going for, a gun in a jacket that was hanging up in the corner of the room. The man pulled the gun and the sheriff shot him directly in the head. The other man didn't move. He was not in a good position to do anything and realized that the sheriff was not messing around. The sheriff took the man into custody and put him in the back of his unit. He looked around the trailer now that it was safe. He found 12 pumpkins in the trailer and the body bag. It was Mr. Loomis, but he was not dead, just sedated. The sheriff went outside and saw an additional trailer he had not seen before. He went in with his gun drawn. He opened the door and yelled for anyone to come out with their hands up. There, he saw 11 people with duct tape on their mouths and hands up already, bound and tied to the wall. He saw Mr. Carpenter and Miss Curtis. The additional people he saw were younger adults that he did not even know were missing. He called for additional backup from the state and was able to save everyone. The FBI came in as well eager to question the man that was alive and responsible for the abduction. Apparently, they were collecting people for involuntary organ harvesting, but the man refused to say who their employer was. All he would say is that our small towns were no longer safe. It was the prime target for their business, because people are so stupid and trusting there. He said that our town had figured it out, but there are more towns and people like them abducting people. Business goes on as usual. When I asked him why they stole the pumpkins, he simply said, I like pumpkins, and it seemed like a funny calling card to steal the pumpkins first, then the people. The FBI sent out a special message to 86 small towns in the area. They were able to arrest 172 men for kidnapping and rescued 946 innocent people from organ harvesting, all because a lone sheriff saw something and did something to stop it. One man can make a difference. Sandra and Ben were parents of Olivia. 
They wanted to be the best parents ever and tried to make sure they did what was best for their daughter. It was Halloween night and they wanted to make sure she had the best experience possible. The last neighborhood they lived in had about 18 children that did everything together. Unfortunately, they decided to move to a bigger and better house far across town. With the new gated community, there was barely anyone out trick-or-treating or houses giving out candy. They went through the whole neighborhood, and Olivia had enough candy to fill a sandwich-sized Ziploc bag. She looked devastated. Olivia got so much candy at her last neighborhood that she had to practically give it away for the next two months. It was a big unfortunate change, and she was so sad. Seeing his daughter in distress, though, Ben decided that they should go to another neighborhood in hopes that they would be busier. He had considered going back to their old neighborhood, but decided that they were starting a new life with a new house and should try to explore the surrounding area. They picked a random neighborhood on the GPS that looked fine and it was about a mile away. They got in the car and started driving. Olivia's sad face soon turned into a happy one as she was going to get lots of candy now. This night had really turned around for her. They parked the car and started going around the houses. The candy was plentiful and there was a major variety even regular sized candies, but the people in this particular neighborhood were weird in some way. They were all slurring their speech, they were way too touchy, and they just had that psycho vibe about them. Olivia didn't notice, but Sandra and Ben did for sure. But because Olivia was happy, they didn't want to stop her from having a good night. They finally made it around enough that Olivia was satisfied with her full bag of candy. They all looked at each other and decided that they would go home. They told Olivia not to touch the candy until they got home though. There was a faint smell of alcohol emanating from the back seat, but it could have just been the smell of Lifesaver gummies or something. They got home and put a towel down, played a Halloween special. Olivia was watching TV as Sarah and Ben went through the candy. They found an open candy. Aha, Sandra said. Ben just looked at her and shook his head. We used to be so cool, and now we're getting excited about finding an open wrapper. They both laughed and continued looking. They found another, and another, and another. Sandra's face was ghostly white at what she was seeing. Almost all the candy was open, and there was something else. There was a blue ooze coming out of the candy. Sandra opened one of the open candies, and found more blue ooze. She broke a peanut butter cup open and found at the center was a concentration of some blue ooze stuff. Concerned, they called the police. When the police arrived, they looked at the candy and got the information of the neighborhood they went to. The police were gone for a while, but came back an hour later. The news he gave us, though, was a bit concerning. The police officer said that the neighborhood had a major issue a few years back and all the residents had moved out. No one lived there. Sandra explained that there were people at all the houses and all the lights were on. The officer explained that the city bought the neighborhood. They compensated all the families so they could get new houses and they were set to demolish the entire area. They wanted to keep the lights on though so it did not attract squatters. So it is possible that someone could have been here and there but on the scale that Sandra was talking about, it would have taken a busload of people and be a coordinated evolution. Sandra asked what was in the candy. The officer said that he wasn't sure, but someone put that in all the candy, probably with a needle with a blue liquid of some kind. He said, don't touch any of it though. The officer left and Sandra and Ben were devastated. What kind of world do we live in? So they all got in the car and drove to Walmart and got Olivia some candy. In the end, everyone was happy. Be careful going to random neighborhoods you don't know. Hey, Spooky Sooner here. Uh, this is uh, one of the Halloween stories I'm doing, and then the next one is Halloween Paranormal Stories. Uh, I think my favorite story that I wrote about that one is about a cup, and if you drink it, crazy stuff happens. So, 
I hope you enjoy that. Um, that'll be coming out um, later, probably in, in a week or so. Uh, but just in time for Halloween, so you guys can play these and binge these at your Halloween parties or if you're just hanging out by yourself. So, uh, picked up 12 subscribers this week. I appreciate all that. And uh, I appreciate the support of all the subscribers before that. So, um, we're actually starting to move pretty good. And uh, thanks for all the support. And I will continue to make new videos. Have a good night and stay spooky. There were Miss King. Miss King. <laughs> Mr. Sheriff. I mean, <laughs> the candy. Mm -mm. Sandra and Ben were parents of Olivia. Uh, okay.